Cliff Plo, and I've spent a third of my world in Farm to Table, California, a third of it in luxury hotels, five stars, and Ritz Carlton's and the like, and then a third of it in the corporate world with Disney, Darden, and most recently Bloomin Brands. And Darden had the chance to create the Seasons 52 concept, and I've been with the ICCA and Kevin since the very beginning, on and off as a yeah. as a partner. Um, but just uh, great to be with everybody today. And here in Florida with Kevin, where there's no virus. <laughs> <laughs> Cliff, I'll never forget when. Uh, and I love blueberries, by the way. <laughs> love that video. Awesome. Cliff at uh, California Grill at uh, Disney. Uh, I'll never forget because that's when I first met you. And early on, actually with one of our other sponsors, Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute. And uh, it was so impressive to see what he created there and then to see his next phase to create Seasons 52 and all the steps he had to go through to create that kind of a, you know, of, of a restaurant that has never been done before. And you know, it was just really interesting to watch the progress of that. So excited. It's kind of fun to work with Disney though, because they, you know, it's all about theatrics and, you know, was tasked with building a restaurant no one would ever forget. And no one mentioned food costs or labor costs for 10 years. So it's not too bad. <laughs> uh, we had 18 line cooks. We, the place was losing a million a year and we brought it to 12 million dinner only. But we had 18 line cooks, hundred percent made from scratch, even pickled ginger, everything. Wow. And uh, we, we would do a thousand covers a night, every night. Um, pretty amazing. But then we did the food and wine fest we created, the Animal Kingdom Lodge, the Boardwalk, Disney Cruise Line, and um, basically took away the food processing center and put chefs in all the restaurants. That was the biggest job. That was over the course of probably seven, eight years. Yeah, that was big. That really was. So Christy? You want to introduce yourself? There we go. Had to hit that mute button. Phrase of the year. Um, yeah. Hi, it's Christy Wood. I'm a senior accountant director at Sterling Rice Group. And um, I'm here on behalf of the United States High Bullish Blueberry Council um, with some of my esteemed colleagues who I look forward to introducing a little later. All right, Casey, you want to tell us about yourself? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Casey Cronquist, president of the U.S. High Bush Blueberry Council out here in California. Great. And a sponsor of GCIA. Thank you for that support. We appreciate Happy it. Happy to do it. You bet. Rosalind? Hi, yes. I am Chef Rosalind Darling. I'm an associate culinary director with Sterling Rice Group. Um, Christy and Jeremy are my partners in crime, um, and my background is mainly food service, but I do have CPG and brand strategy along with my culinary uh, background. So thank you for having me. Well, thanks for being here. We appreciate it. The next one over, you can see Mike Speltz. You guys all know who he is. So Mike's in the background here running videos and doing all the things he always does to make us all look good. So Carly, you want to go next? Hi, uh, my name is Carly Levin. Um, I've been in market research for about seven years, um, but with Data Central, I'm working with food uh, for about four. Um, food is my passion. I'm an account manager at Data Central and I'm also our plant-based expert. So I love um, seeing trends that are popping and looking at um, what drives them. And Jeremy. Yeah, great. Last but not least, I guess. Uh, my name is Jeremy Kay, and I'm the Director of Brand Environments at SRG, Sterling Rice Group. On, we are here on behalf of the U.S. High Bush Blueberry Council. Um, and the Director of Brand Environments is really our fancy term for uh, architecture. So I take brands that we develop, and then I, I kind of manifest them in the built environment. So restaurant design and, and the like. So happy to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks. Well, we're going to get started, everyone. So um, Carly um, is really kind of interesting. We had a conversation uh, with her and also Jack Lee, of course, uh, on what we wanted to do. So the theme here and in the theme for our new webinar uh, series is called Innovation to Inspire, a Vision for Tomorrow's Menus. So we thought really spending a lot more time here uh, with Carly so she can share with us a lot of the details that they learned throughout last year and through this pandemic so far, but also their vision for the future and what they see um, coming out of this in the next couple of quarters and getting toward the end of the year to hopefully back to some more sense of uh, normalcy. So Carly, you are on and we look forward to it. 
All right. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to 2021. We're finally here. Um, and let's talk about some of what the last year looks like, looked like, what we think the future is going to look like, and um, hopefully some good news. So to get started, let's take a look at um, what last year looked like for the industry and what we expect next year is going to look like. So last year, we saw about a 28% decline in food service business or dollars spent, and um, we were pretty spot on with our initial forecast at the beginning of um, COVID with what that would look like. We do see a partial recovery in 2021, but of course, numerous things could impact or change this, but we're still um, projecting a 7% increase over that 2020 baseline. Um, this isn't a one-size-fits-all projection. It really depends on the segment that you're in. And we can perhaps um, get some more insights around that by taking a look at what 2020 looked like for certain segments and what we think 2021 is going to look like. Of course, certain segments were hit harder in 2020 and certain segments are projected to recover faster in 2021. We know that on-site and full service were really decimated in 2020, but there are some factors that might make some of these recover faster than others, such as CNU, because once the students come back to campus, they're going to get to their normal level of business pretty quickly. QSR, of course, held up in 2020 and will continue to improve in 2021. Um, with fast casual, it's more of a mixed bag. We expect brands that have done well with digital, like Chipotle, um, you know, their app is super easy to order from, their consumers are used to doing it. Um, they've done well during the pandemic, and that will likely continue to hold up in 2021. Um, so, you know, focus on maintaining that digital presence and getting your consumers used to ordering that way. Overall, for 2021, we're expecting more of a partial recovery than a full recovery this year as we rebuild from the pandemic. And of course, there have been many numbers floating around on overall restaurant closures. We've seen headlines that say things like restaurant closings have topped um, 110,000 and that the industry is in free fall or that 85% of independent restaurants might go out of business by the end of 2020, or um, other projections that half of independent restaurants have already closed. And, you know, we don't think that half of all restaurants have really closed. And think about driving through your neighborhood and think about the restaurants you see. Does it look like half of them have closed? And I I'm going to guess in most places, the answer is going to be no. So there aren't a lot of concrete numbers out there, and we wanted to add some clarity and show what those real numbers actually are and make some informed guesses as to how they might evolve. We can do that using our Firefly database, which is a universal operator database. It has every operator that serves food in the country, um, all restaurants and every hospital, grocery store, you name it. With this, we can track restaurant openings and closures, and now we can do that even on a weekly basis. So here are some stats from our previous webinars for restaurants that existed prior to COVID. Um, we think of our D-Day kind of cutoff date for COVID is March 11th. Of course, um, unbeknownst to most of us, COVID was already circulating in the world. But around March 11th, um, the NBA called off games. Um, countries began to close their borders. That was really kind of the defining moment for the pandemic. So that's, we're considering March 11th and on the beginning of COVID in a sense. So of restaurants that have opened on March 10th, how many have closed since then? We can see as of May, most of those closures were temporary, but as time went on, the temporary closures went down and the permanent closures inched up. Um, and in September, 2.9% um, of restaurants were temporarily closed and 5% were permanently closed. Oops, let me go back there. Um, so, you know, we can see that temporary continued to decline, um, and there was a fairly large spike in permanent closures in the three months between the end of December and end, um, end of September and end of December. That cl permanently closed number actually almost doubled. And that's because we're at a point um, at the end of the year where there's pretty significant financial stress, and it was a breaking point for a lot of restaurants, typically independent restaurants. We could almost predict this because a lot of operators throughout the pandemic had been doing whatever they could and working furiously every single day just to last. And at some point they couldn't make it anymore. 
So what are those, um, here's what this equals on a unit basis. So we can see as of December 28th, 2.5% um, of restaurants were temporarily closed, about 10% were permanently closed and 12% uh, total were closed, um, which equals about 19,000 temporarily closed, about 69,000 permanently closed and about a total of 88,000 total closed. So that's not quite as high as that 110,000 number. It's not nearly as high as those 50, 75 or even 80% numbers, but the numbers are at about um, a 12% closure. And we hope and remain hopeful that about um, those 19,000 temporary closures will eventually reopen. And closures have lagged, but they could accelerate as we um, inch a little further into 2021 and some operators decide that it's just not sustainable to stay open anymore. Here's what um, that looks like um, on a uh, cuisine basis. Um, so we can see the percent of restaurants in that cuisine that have closed, um, taking a look at this chart. And of course, no surprise, buffet tops the list, um, followed by French bistro and soup and salad. Um, Thai places and bagel places are actually the least closed here. So um, what's been closing in that three month period that's kind of the end of the year here? So how many more places of each of these cuisines have closed? We sorted this by the most additional closures on a percentage basis. So even though buffets were the most closed overall, they continue to lead the pack in the most additional closures since September. Um, there are some interesting patterns here. It's not all even and there are different breakpoints for different types of restaurants. There are other factors at play here that are include not just menu type, but segment, and perhaps most importantly, where these operators are located. What does the neighborhood look like? Did it have a lot of workers? Have they left? A lot of downtown neighborhoods like Manhattan or even downtown Chicago um, that are mostly primarily office buildings with workers looking for lunch, dinners, and happy hours. Um, all those workers have gone and are now working from home. And these downtown areas are more likely to have certain types of restaurants than rural areas. Um, Indian, for example, is much more common in a downtown type of neighborhood. Another way of thinking of this is of all the restaurants that have closed, um, what are the share of menu types represented in those closures? So of the 80,000 restaurant closures we've seen, about 18% are varied menu types. Um, about 6% are Mexican, 5% are burger, 10% are sandwich deli. But what's really interesting about this is that 11% were pizza restaurants. And we've said that pizza would be a great beneficiary of COVID because it's so delivery friendly. We'll see later that consumers consider it one of the most delivery friendly um, options out there. There are, of course, many different types of pizza chains, and some did enormously well, especially pizza chains where consumers knew that they could, what type of pizza they could get, they knew the delivery quality was good, or legacy brands with that same level of consumer trust. But others didn't do well and got to the point where they had to close, and this says something. And that's a lot of this is in control of the operator. In a way, we all have control over our own destinies, and it depends on how you execute a menu, what you want to do for marketing, and how quickly you're able to pivot to respond to new needs among the pandemic. The future isn't preordained here. Pizza, being a pizza restaurant doesn't necessarily equal success, and being a buffet restaurant doesn't necessarily equal failure. I'm going to talk about some interesting pivots that we've seen um, with, you know, restaurants architecture and SRG is going to expand on that in a little bit here. Um, but it seems like every day we hear about some major chain revealing the remodel. Um, this is a headline about Applebee's restaurant in uh, Texarkana, and it's actually one of the first casual chains that's really getting into drive through. Of course, QSR and fast casuals are already going deep in. Um, there, a Shake Shack just did a remodel that's honestly more of a drive through than it is an actual restaurant, which is a big departure from the feel of the restaurants. Is this what the national restaurant landscape is going to look like? Are consumers going to continue to use drive through after COVID like they did during? And um, because of all this remodeling, the infrastructure is certainly going to be there. Um, a lot of places have expanded to offer multiple drive through lanes, curbside pickup windows, and et cetera. And re redesigns like this are the future of the industry. Um, and it's focused on a quick service model. And consumers are becoming more used to picking things up to eat off premise. And has all this innovation changed the view of the drive-through? Um, are consumers going to think it's more cool now or more trendy? 
So this is um, a redesigned Schlotz keys, um, a mock-up of one, and you can see it looks very different from your traditional LSR restaurant. There's of course the standard drive-through lane, but the front is much more open with a pickup window and a window that you can order from. And you can see that nice open space where you can actually choose to eat right outside of the restaurant or perhaps take it to go. There are some new Sonic locations that have an entertainment hangout area outside. So again, avoiding um, the concerns from inside dining, but still giving consumers an experience and kind of a cool place to eat. Um, the Sonic locations have cornhole and games in addition to nice seating areas too. But um, just like the Schlotzkys, it also caters to people who want fast food with a drive through um, We are seeing and expect to continue to see segments melding. Casual operators like Applebee's are now going for those off-premise occasions. But when COVID is over, they still have the capability and consumers can still choose to go inside and dine. And same thing with QSR and Fast Casual. Now there are more exciting and inviting outdoor spaces for consumers consumers to dine there too. So um, drop a note in the chat if you know who this is. Um, and I will tell you this is a YouTuber. Um, and his name is Mr. Beast. And he's actually one of has one of the biggest subscriber bases on YouTube. He's got nearly 50 million subscribers. And he's known for elaborate stunts and giving away money, meals, and uh, even private islands to strangers. This is a restaurant that he opened, and it was the world's first free restaurant where you actually get paid to go eat at the restaurant. You can go to that pickup window and you get burgers and a bag full of cash, which can be, um, you know, any denomination between like $5 to 1000 Of course, it instantly went viral, but there's a little more to the story. Simultaneously, they opened 300 locations across the country, and these were not free. Um, virtual dining concepts like this um, can use existing restaurant kitchens. This one used Buca di Beppo um, as ghost kitchens to launch. Every burger at every location of these Mr. Beast restaurants, all 300, sold out within one day. One Buca di Beppo operator said they sold something like $7,000 worth of burgers and $2,000 worth of other menu items just in one day. So this can be a really successful partnership for the operators, too. I thought it was really interesting how they determined where to put these 300 locations because they didn't just like randomly drop them or put them in big metros. They actually looked at Mr. B's YouTube viewership to determine the areas where his biggest fan bases were. And then the YouTubers all got together to figure out where all the locations were. So it was really a collaborative effort. This was only made possible by ghost kitchens and we'll likely see more of this in the future. Um, we've heard about uh, virtual dining concepts has said they're planning to partner with Polly D from the Jersey Shore to do a sub restaurant. So we'll be seeing a lot more viral pop up limited time restaurants and competition is going to be fierce and unpredictable. You'll also see the rise of virtual brands versus ghost kitchens. Um, virtual brands like Brinker's Just Wings will be successful, for example. So um, this is a screenshot of Jack Lee's iPhone. This is a DoorDash um, and he's located in Nashville. Um, so you can pull out your phone now, search your delivery service and type in the word beast and see if Mr. Beast Burger comes up near you. Do you have one? And if you do, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, but what's innovative about this is you can instantly create a hundred plus unit chain. And the activity isn't driven by the restaurants, as we mentioned, but by social media buzz and celebrities. So think about how you can use um, any excess kitchen capacity to create virtual brands like this. And even if you don't know Mr. Beast or you know other YouTubers or think that's a fit for your consumers, at some point there will likely be a pop-up or an opportunity for a pop-up that speaks to you based on your fandom or tribe or your consumers. What's a fit for your brand? You really don't have to build a brick and mortar restaurant from scratch anymore. Another interesting thing about this is note that disclaimer that this was made in a local kitchen. Um, as consumers are realizing that a lot of these virtual brands are backed by bigger, more familiar brands, they've begun to demand transparency. They want to know who is making their food and where it's being made. Um, one more pivot. Um, this is a picture of Parachute, um, which is in Chicago. It's a Michelin starred restaurant. It's one of the best restaurants in Chicago. On the right, we have a picture of their little pea menu, which is uh, part of their pickup menu, and they pivoted to make seasonal baby food. Um, one of the versions in this picture is pumpkin. 
Some of the proceeds from this baby food go to organizations that support single moms in the hospitality in industry. And restaurants are discovering and appealing to life issues that people are having right now. Uh, normally, the crowd that Parachute caters to is coming in for a special occasion. They're planning to stay for hours, spend a few hundred dollars. And if they have kids, they're going to be left at home with the babysitter. But now Parachute needs to figure out how to cater to that same consumer with the whole family at home. So let's talk about new restaurant openings uh, during COVID. And yes, there have been some. Um, so how many new restaurants do you think have opened since uh, March 11th? And um, feel free to drop a guess in the chat. Um, not giving you any guidelines here, so they might be all over. That actual number is about 12,000. And of these 12,000 restaurants that have opened during COVID, the vast majority are still open. And when I say new restaurants, these aren't reopenings. These are restaurants that have opened their doors for the very first time. They've cut the ribbon. It's the grand opening during COVID. If we take a look at what those openings look like, um, we can see we have the unit counts above each cuisine type. And um, on the right here, we can see the segments that they represent, the share of COVID openings represented by those segments, and then the index. So are they opening at a faster rate than they existed in the wild pre-COVID? There are, of course, a lot of pizza places. They account for almost 20% of these new openings. We can also see that quick service and fast casual are opening more quickly and fine dining is few and far between, which makes sense. Let's take a look at those openings by month. Um, this is January through November. We don't quite have those final December numbers yet, but um, here's how many openings we had each month. And you can really see them drop off a cliff um, starting in March, April was really dire. And we've also had a slowdown in opening um, around September, October, November too. Here's what those look like versus last year. So the gray bars are the total restaurant openings in 2019, pink is 2020. And um, how does this compare to a normal year? If we can remember what that feels like. We actually already started off 2020 before the pandemic a little slower than we normally would for whatever reasons. And then we can see a huge degree of drop versus a normal year like in April. On average, restaurants opened up at one quarter the rate as they would have versus a normal year, but we, we expect that to pick up next year, although we need to make it through this current wave. So what's 2021 going to look like? First off, there's still concerns about the pandemic. Hospitalizations are way up. And if we take a look at this map from the New York Times of ICU bed occupancy, uh, basically the bigger and redder the circle, the worse it is. We can see there are still some big concerns and, and a lot of places are actually starting to run out of ICU bed capacity. And that's reflected in consumer sentiment. As a result, people are still pretty on edge even as of a couple days ago. Almost 50% say they're avoiding eating out, and we'd hope to see this number drop. We think it will, but we're basically stabilized and there's not much change from a month ago. So how do people feel about the future as we move past 2020 and go into 2021? Is this picture a representation? Yeah, um, we see some cautious optimism. About two thirds of consumers are optimistic for the new year. Um, and you'll note that there's big optimism, especially among millennials and Gen X. We see less for boomers who are perhaps more impacted by COVID health concerns and also for Gen Z. And um, just as a personal anecdote, my sister graduated college, my Gen Z sister in January 2020 of this year, and she just found a job in December. So I can understand why this Gen Z number is a little low. They're graduating and entering the professional workforce in the middle of a pandemic. So we ask consumers, you know, of those of you that were optimistic about, you know, 2021, what do you think is going to happen in 2021? And um, that second reason, the country will have coronavirus under control soon. Half of us are hopeful and confident that it will be under control soon. And of course, once that happens, we'll be allowed to see our families and go out to eat and see friends and return to a semblance of normal life. And a big part of that is the vaccine is on the horizon. 67% of us plan to get vaccinated. And even about a third of consumers who say that they're not concerned about COVID at all are still planning on getting the vaccine. The narrative has kind of turned from it not just being about safeguarding yourself, but about safeguarding other people around you from you if you're potentially a carrier of the virus. 
Um, so what are people most looking forward to once they're vaccinated? And number two, only understanding friends and family is going out to restaurants. You know, this has been really hard on our industry. We're a gathering place. Um, but as soon as people can gather, restaurants are one of the first places that they want to go. And in fact, 67% of us plan to visit restaurants more once we're vaccinated and 19% plan to do so right away. If we take a look at the bottom here, how quickly you see traffic pick up once vaccination becomes widespread might depend on your consumer base. If you have more millennial and Gen X consumers, you might tend to see traffic pick up a little faster um, versus if you have um, a boomer audience, it might be a slower turnaround. Still during the pandemic, we have been visiting restaurants in some capacity. In fact, a third of us have um, dined inside a restaurant. This is some info from our October 1st webinar. Um, so even back then, I can imagine these numbers have only increased. Food boredom has definitely settled in. 65% uh, of us, including me, are tired of cooking at home. 58% of us are bored of comfort foods. We ate all our banana bread. We ate all our sourdough. We ate all our mac and cheese and burgers. Um, so we're looking for either you know, healthier foods or new twists on those comfort foods, which we'll hear a little bit more about later. And 79% of us are craving something brand new. And um, one of our biggest learnings from the recessions and one of our biggest takeaways now is that innovation is going to be how food service wins. Consumers still want those new flavors. They want those new experiences and dishes, and they're used to getting them from restaurants and they trust restaurants to introduce them to them. I took a look at some uh, chain introductions over the past few months because I was curious to see if they'd continued to be innovative, had um, you know, trends slowed down, and the answer was actually no. So I took a flavor like Nashville Hot, and the interesting thing to me is you have some, uh, someone like Shoney's who's introducing the classic Nashville Hot Chicken Sandwich to the first time, but at other operators, the trend actually evolved, so it didn't stay stagnant throughout COVID. Um, here, Nashville Hot is in new formats like these Nashville hot chicken nuggets from the Cheesecake Factory, or even on a pizza from Blaze. The same thing happened with plant-based at the beginning of COVID um, and, you know, right before the focus was on burgers, burgers, burgers. Um, but now the formats and even in some cases, the type of protein being mimicked has changed. Uh, Glory Days did an impossible cheesecake sandwich, uh, cheesecake sandwich. Be, um, Pizza Hut did a Beyond sausage pizza with uh, Beyond meatballs. And there's even a chickenless uh, faux chicken pollo taco from El Pollo Loco. So the trend has evolved and changed. Of course, um, right now, as a lot of consumers are still mostly doing delivery and takeout, um, the trust and willingness to try trends can depend on how well they consider the food to travel or how well they consider it to be suited to delivery or to go. And of course, um, pizza is classic. It's actually rated um, as being more appealing um, from delivery than dine-in even. Um, but other things like breakfast sandwiches, burgers, um, things that pair well with innovative new flavors still have a higher than average trust for delivery or to go. So um, I'm going to take I'm going to leave you with some inspiration um, for the new year. Of course, there are hundreds of flavors and exciting new trending ingredients that we could pick from. Um, but I want you to think about some sauces and flavors that you can add to um, perhaps an existing dish like a burger, or like a pizza that could draw interest. Um, and so the first one, oops, the next one uh, is going to be two um, sauces from the Levant, which is a trend that we saw before COVID, and um, we're still seeing it on menus. This is Labna. It's grown by 71% on menus over the past four years. It's a strained yogurt. And think about perhaps stirring it into dairy-based sauces like a ranch. It's typically offered as a dip, but um, it's very versatile. Another sauce from the Levant that we've seen is Tomb. It's grown by 700% on menus over the past four years. And Tomb is very similar to aioli. It's a garlic, olive oil, and salt emulsion. Um, but the nice thing about it is um, because it doesn't have the egg or you know, the dairy that aioli does, it's actually plant-based and vegan. So it fits into a lot of specialty diets like keto, like plant-based. Spicy also continues to grow. Um, we've seen specific pepper callouts and hot sauces and Fresno is a pepper type that we've seen grown on menus over the past four years. Spicy honey is also gaining traction in that uh, sweet and spicy flavor profile. Um, sometimes operators, um, more innovative operators will call out the specific peppers they use in that honey too. 
And then finally, classic Southern food um, comeback sauce, which is like kind of a spicy, creamy sauce has been growing on menus. And white barbecue sauce is a twist on, um, you know, barbecue, which is another just classic comfort food. Um, and this is an Alabama regional style. Um, so uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. It's been great speaking to you today. And um, here's to hoping that 2021 is better for all of us. And we are all out sitting down inside without masks and eating at our favorite restaurants soon. So I've got a question for you, uh, Carly. The mm -hmm. uh, French Bistro closures like were really high, but also they were the lowest in openings. Is it because they're perceived more upscale or expensive restaurants and independent or why was it? I think so. I think that's part of it. A lot of them are sit down type restaurants. Um, I noticed, and this just might be anecdotal um, from restaurants near me for lunch. Um, you know, French bistros seem to offer like more lunch and dinner options too. And I feel like a lot of us are just grabbing a quick lunch at home now. Um, there's actually also not as much familiarity with French cuisine. Um, most of us only know a handful of dishes within the cuisine and not the cuisine as a whole. I think it's in um, the adoption stage on our map curve. So that might be contributing to it too. I don't um, want to try something that seems more upscale and something I'm not as familiar with. That makes sense. And it's interesting, many of the other ethnic cuisines were on the other side of that. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we found that actually Mexican food is the most craved food by consumers from restaurants during the pandemic too. So depending on what type of cuisine, um, that can have an impact as well. Yeah, awesome. Well, thanks. Well, we're going to move on here, Christy. Um, why don't you come on? You're going to do a brief introduction of what you guys are about to talk about. And then I know we've got a video we'll show when you're ready for us to show it. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks again, Carly, for sharing those trends. There's obviously so much happening in the industry right now, and it can be challenging to keep up with all of the data and changes. Um, at Sterling Rice Group, our charge is to help our clients, including the United States Highbush Blueberry Council, navigate all of that through design, marketing, and culinary support. And in fact, the Schlotzky's redesign that Carly shared is a great example of some of SRG's environmental design work um, that helped to address some pain points for their operation and really keep them ahead of the industry. So today, Jeremy, Chef Rosalind, and I are excited to share some more of our recent work in collaboration with Blueberries. So to tee that up, I will hand off to USHBC President Casey Cronquist. All right, thank you, Christy, and uh, I appreciate this. Uh, I first wanna just start off by saying a big thank you to all of you who have taken the time to join today's gathering, and certainly for all you do already to promote blueberries. And thank you to Kevin and GCIA. I'm excited to be with all of you today, and a great presentation, Carly, by the way. As president of the U.S. Highbush Blueberry Council, I certainly wanna reiterate our support for your efforts to preserve through the day-to-day. -day. Well, uh, hang on one second there striving to uh, constantly innovate. You know, at the USHBC, we're working hard similarly to come alongside you and your teams with new ideas to research and trends to help you stay current and keep your men menus full of inspiring possibilities there are for blueberries. So I wanna take this moment just to recognize, you know, what we heard uh, in the presentation, the impacts of this past year and the circumstances that are still facing the food service industry uh, and that we know are significant and not lost on us here at the council. Uh, the consequences of the shutdowns and the openings and the shutdowns certainly out here in California have long-term implications and we wanna be a resource uh, to you all to build back better. Uh, that said, uh, the USHBC has teamed up with the SRG team to share some of the hot off the presses intellectual property with you all that aims to shed some light on the design and culinary that can evolve to meet the shifting uh, patterns and needs and uh, and how blueberries can deliver for the restaurant of the future. So thank you again. Uh, we're excited to be here. All right, let's roll, Kevin. In light of the many challenges that have hit the food service industry this year, SRG, in partnership with the U.S. Highbush Blueberry Council, has done a deep dive into what the restaurant of the future may look like, how it will meet the shifting demands of operators and patrons alike, and how the culinary landscape will evolve along with it. We're excited to take you on this tour of how blueberries deliver for the restaurant of the future. So let's take a look. In the future, four-walled architecture may be too restrictive for restaurant operations. Building footprints and indoor dining rooms may get smaller, while patio and outdoor dining spaces increase dramatically. In addition, 
drive throughs vending, pickup lockers, and curbside will become commonplace in operations well beyond QSR. And the food will evolve right along with it. You'll see chef-inspired fare once only available in the dining room, now being offered at drive throughs and through other to-go methods. A perfect example, the PB&B peanut butter and blueberry burger, which is a classic cheeseburger with a thick smear of creamy peanut butter, a nest of caramelized onions, and a generous dollop of house-made blueberry jam. Plus, this jam, which uses cost-efficient frozen blueberries, can be used across all day parts and menus and as the perfect finishing touch for desserts, like this instant classic over-the-top blueberry pie milkshake. Grab-and-go, delivery, and 24-hour vending is also on the rise and a great way to give your consumers more flexibility and convenience on how to purchase from you. Accordingly, formats that hold well, look great, and deliver on flavor are a necessity. No one wants plates of soggy beige food. Enter sweet and savory blueberry hummuses that offer a colorful update to this trusty standby. Another winner is this blueberry brie and walnut wrap that can be prepped ahead of time and held chilled, then reheated at home if the patron wishes. Personalization also remains important, so look for customizable applications that can be built before your eyes, like this layered blueberry couscous salad that utilizes fresh blueberries that have been quick pickled to preserve their perfection and add some sweet tang and vibrant color to this rainbow build. This blueberry application is also great for replumping fresh blueberries that may be a little past their prime and dried out, so no fresh blueberry will ever go to waste. Now let's take a quick peek inside our restaurant of the future, where we're expecting a much larger heart of the house that will respond in kind to the increased walk-up foot traffic, curbside pickup, third-party delivery orders, and prep for grab-and-go. When it comes to takeout, it's imperative for operators to still deliver delicious, upscale food that travels well and can be dressed to impress for patrons at home. Our collection of blueberry barbecue sauces are the perfect plus-up to traditional barbecue fare, these sauces offer sweet, smoky, robust flavors that will keep patrons coming back for something distinctive and craveable with a health halo to boot. Take and Make is also growing like mad and we love this blueberry overnight cream cheese French toast bake that uses the unsung workhorse of the canned blueberry to efficiently add impact and flavor to an otherwise simple build that is sure to delight patrons. It's worth noting that canned, dried, and frozen blueberries are all underutilized winners for operators and that they offer all the versatility, flavor, and health cues of fresh at a fraction of the cost and with longer shelf lives. Let's move to the front of the house. While kitchens will continue to increase in square footage to meet growing demand from multiple channels, many indoor dining rooms may continue to shrink in size in favor of outside or flexible spaces. With that said, Menu rationalization will continue as a very real trend, so applications that work all day long will be key. Our blueberry avocado toast, blueberry croque madame, and blueberry Mediterranean meatballs are items that play perfectly from all day breakfast and brunch, through to lunch, and even into later day parts. Given the necessity for flexibility and agility, unique space efficient experiences will be key. Take this bar that transforms from an espresso bar and coffee counter by day to a cocktail bar by night. And operators can repurpose many of the same ingredients behind the bar no matter what the hour. Take this non-dairy blueberry milk that is just as delicious in tea and coffee lattes as it is in boozy or mocktail versions of horchata, white Russians, and more. That blueberry jam we featured on the PB&B burger is also a perfect bar accoutrement to concoct a blueberry whiskey sour, margarita, mule, or mojito. Thanks for joining us to see how blueberries deliver for the restaurant of the future. That's great. Great video. Thank you. So, yeah, back to uh, all of you. So uh, I don't know who's going back, Jeremy, um, Rosalind. Yeah. So whoever yeah, would like to jump in. Yeah, so, uh, you know, we, we first created this video um, and, and first started thinking kind of about the restaurant of the future uh, in March, right, when, when COVID hit. And at SRG, we do a lot of looking back to look forward. And so the first thing I did was like, is there any precedent to what is happening right now? Has this ever happened before? And how does architecture specifically um, 
respond to that. And I actually to go back a hundred years, a little more than a hundred years to the Spanish flu of 1918, uh, when all these pandemics were ravaging the world, not just the country. And what happened was, is that people started to realize that the homes and the architecture that they were building were actually catalysts for uh, the spread of all these diseases. So they used to live in these homes and visit these stores that were a little darker and they had heavy drapery and heavy carpets and it was trapping germs and there wasn't a lot of ventilation. And so what happened was designers and architects started kind of rejecting that old notion of architecture and the birth of modernist architecture as we know it was the result of the pandemic, which is fascinating to me. Like our, we changed the way we build and live in our cities and homes because of a pandemic. And so I actually believe that we're kind of at that time now as well, where um, we're facing uh, truly unprecedented crises right now with the pandemic and with the social unrest. And it's gonna be really interesting to see how we move forward. And we're already starting to see this as you saw in Carly's presentation about drive-throughs and everything, how we respond to that from a design perspective. But at SRG, we do everything holistically as well. So it's not just about design, it's also how food changes. And I know Chef Rosalind has some thoughts on, on how the culinary landscape changes as well. Yeah, I think that's been a really great collaboration with you, Jeremy, just to see how the environmental design and the experience plays out. Because I agree, I think that the evolution of the back of house and as food service as we know it, it has already been on this track and that COVID actually accelerated the pace. You know, when we were doing street dives with some of our clients and some operators, we were seeing, you know, locations that had a pure takeout model or a delivery model that was already remote. Um, one of our fried chicken chains here that's local in Denver, Bird Call, you know, you order online and then you have a pickup window. You actually don't interact with any of the back of house or any of the staff. So seeing this play out on a much larger scale out of the necessity of something like COVID um, has been really actually incredible to watch um, and seeing how fast our industry has been able to pivot and the knowledge sharing between it. I really hope that the video that we shared can offer some tidbits of information of um, not just how to survive what our pandemic is, but what's the next chapter for our industry as a whole? And how do we really thrive and you know, use this uh, challenge as a launch point to the evolution of food service innovation? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah well, well said, Chef, Chef Wilson. And I'll just add to that for, for the members watching today, like what we see in terms of a uh, design experiential standpoint is really the future proofing of your restaurant. So all the methods that we're talking about with drive-through and curbside and delivery and automation and digital, that's all the future proof. Because uh, I hate to say it and, and some of the, any other architects on the on the line now may, may shake their head, but as, as a designer, we've done a really poor job of future proofing restaurant concepts. We really have. I mean, look at the pandemic. It's just decimated the restaurant industry because we've designed spaces that, that didn't know how to respond to something like this. Now, could we have prepared for it better? Yeah, probably. So anything we do moving forward is really about the, the future proofing of your establishment. And future proofing for the back of house as well. And thinking about, you know, what do we know, um, for example, with blueberries of all the different formats, you know, knowing that we have fresh and frozen, but how do we even move beyond that? How do we go into canned? How do we go into dry infused to utilize our ingredients so that we can you know, add value while still driving profitability um, and versatility in our pantry. Yeah, well, that's great. Jeremy, um, your architectural background, uh, what do you see like in the future? Do you see, you know, these very large, you know, r dining room areas really worked out well for some companies because they could do, you know, they could spread people out better and actually do better. However, a cost comes with that. Where are we gonna be a year from now or when this is over, do you see, you know, dining rooms shrinking still? Do you see them keeping them larger, but keeping more space? You know, it's such a, an interesting question. And, um, you know, to throw it back to data essentials, I'm gonna answer this question, but I was watching one of their episodes and Jack Lee said, there's a million different beta tests going on right now, right? Like we, we just don't know. What I can tell you is I think of COVID as like the great condenser uh, of time. So we've seen trends and those trends are historic. The historic trends of a couple of years is that dining rooms are shrinking. They're going from six, seven and a half thousand feet down to five, down to 2,500 feet. Um, so they're shrinking. And I think COVID has condensed that timeline to where the prevalence of pickup and, and 
uh, pre-order takeout and all that, uh, we're going to see a lot more of those units where you're actually, there's no in indoor dining whatsoever. Now, I do think as we, as we talked about in the video, um, that outdoor spaces and flex spaces are going to continue to grow. And there's going to be an interesting rise of third spaces that we don't even know what that is yet, Kevin, right? Like, yeah. so if people are taking their food away, they still want that humanistic touch of interacting with another human being or socializing while you're eating. So are we going to give rise to new area, new public places where people are going to congregate and, and eat? And, and then how is how are restaurants going to plug into that and respond to that? It's just fascinating. It's like a, a design renaissance happening right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with the flexibility of that dining space. And um, we've seen the rise of what I call uh, the middle of the house. So a lot of in-dining spaces have turned into a staging area for takeout and delivery. So I think that in the future, flexibility will definitely be key. And that, that's a really great way of saying it, Jeremy, what Jack Lee said, that um, we're all in a kind of like a one big uh, fast-paced incubator. So it'll be exciting to see what prevails. Yep. That's yeah. great. Before we go to Cliff, uh, Casey, got a question for you. Um, the growers um, and farmers, I mean, what what's in their head right now? Are they optimistic about the future and where things are going? Are they concerned? Yeah, I would say uh, optimistic, certainly. I, you know, we spent a good part of our, our prep for 2021 and our fall meetings together uh, just talking about the possibilities ahead for blueberries because of the impact the pandemic has had on just the health, I mean, you, you heard Carly talk about it, just the way people are shifting their thinking, you know, whether about, whether it's a, a health conscious concern or, or it's just an ingredient they're, that they're, they haven't had or enjoyed in a, a mix of things that, you know, maybe have gotten stagnant in their, in their diet. And I think blueberries pop in that thought of, hey, you know, this is something that, you know, I hadn't considered for this drink or I hadn't considered for this, uh, um, uh, you know, in this case, a menu item, but certainly they're at home, you know, thinking about it from the consumer consumer standpoint, just how much uh, growth opportunity there still is yet ahead for blueberries. So we spent the fall just kind of encouraging our growers to understand that, you know, as they continue to grow blueberries and they're coming, uh, you know, the season is, is, is upon us here. Uh, you know, there's going to be a great home for them in the future of what we're seeing in the minds of consumers. That's great. Thank you. So Cliff, um, I, I've been around you a lot in my career and seen what a visionary you are. And I'm excited to uh, have you talk, you know, within this context, especially this, you know, first in our webinar series, looking at innovation, looking at the future, looking down the road, couldn't think of a better person to have, you know, anchor this for us. So Cliff, you're on. Well, thank you. Very flattering. Very nice to be with all of you um, for an hour today. And, um, you know, I just want to give it up for the Blueberry team. Pretty inspiring. The um, topic is, you know, innovation to inspire. Totally inspirational. Last night I went out and bought blueberries, made blueberry, blueberry barbecue. And um, I've gotten into this pressure cooking or Instapot uh, Kahlua pig. And I took the blueberry and made blueberry barbecue, put it over the top. Living in Florida, we got Florida, we got no virus and we got banana leaves. So I put banana leaf underneath it, put it in a bowl and said, why do bowls always have this connotation of health? Why not put some comfort in there and then put blueberries on top? And so here's a, the only fact I have in my presentation is that blueberries are key in a major move, which is immunity. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, immunity and cognitive health. So as people ended up in a situation where their routines were compromised or, um, you know, they had different ways to work out. It wasn't just how am I going to look, but how do I feel? And it was more time to explore things like the diet and blueberries and salmon and mushrooms are all loaded with the things we need. So, um, you know, you, I know they say that about Michigan, go blue, but I'm just going to say go blue. I'm a fan. Um, I'm working on it all the time. It's great stuff. And tonight they're having blueberry mules in the tiki bar out back. So, um, then the other part of your thing, Kevin, was the uh, vision for tomorrow's menu. And what's fascinating is some of these presentations, Carly, amazing facts and things. I have no facts. But from a chef's point of view, a lot of times we come up and make our own sheet music and uh, we kind of color it in as we go. And But that doesn't mean we don't have a framework. So I have a thing I call consumer foresight or culinary foresight, and in this case, a framework for it. And I kind of want to share that for you. So in just a quick method, you, if you just go down, you know, consumers aren't driving, so they have more time. They're at home, so they're either stressed or more relaxed that they can have their kids and dogs on 
in the meeting with you. Um, kids are home. That means could, are they, could they be educated more or could they be employed or involved and engaged more? And at what level? And certainly that's cooking because they're doing it all the time. I uh, just talked about workouts and the, the elements that can be added in immunity. Uh, meetings that don't exist where you have to prepare and be in a room now provide us with more time to think and prepare ourselves for how we want it to go. Um, uh, events don't take place. There's less of the kids' sports events. There's less concerts to go to, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, less travel. So do, what does that do to our pace? What are we doing with our pace? And, and have you all had a day when you actually said, what day is it? Um, so routine has been smashed, which leads to one of the trends I see, and that's comfort. So if our routine's not the same, when we can have something that's comfortable, we want to go there. Um, and then cooking, it touched on it in one of the presentations where, you know, on the plus side, we're exploring, we're learning more, we're engaging, we're bonding over cooking experiences. But on the negative side, we're just over it. Nobody wants to cook anymore. Maybe they weren't good cooks to begin with and they're, uh, it's just destroyed them. They're bored with it and flavor and, and doing dishes, all the stuff that comes with that. So um, that's just kind of the framework you go through real fast to discover the needs need state that you might enter into. I uh, boiled it down to a few things that could be a focus. And again, I don't have facts. All my job here in Kevin's words is just vision for tomorrow's menu. And uh, I just did, you know, took a first swipe at it. And the only thing here is to give you a thought to at the end of this session to just walk away and say, well, that's pretty cool. Let me try that. But um, I think, you know, stealth health is in the picture. And here's what's interesting about it. A lot of diets out there require uh, some, something to take away, something you not you can't do. You got to get rid of it. You got to cut it out. You got to have deprivation, right? But immunity is not that way. We're already doing it. All we need to do is get more credit for those foods. And as culinarians, be more into the chemistry side and more into the uh, physician side almost. And how do we mix that cocktail for immunity? It's already in the foods we're eating. Um, and... Then there's the, um, the idea that celebration is never going to stop and neither is convenience. So things like celebrating at Capitol Grill with a steak or going through Chick-fil-A's drive-in are not going to go away. But, you know, if you create mediocrity in the middle, you're not going to win. Why would I leave my house for mediocrity? I might leave to celebrate. I might leave for a thematic thing, you know, my fish camp on the river. Um, but certainly convenience is going to be there. So just a thought. And, um, you know, and when, it, when you talk about something like Capitol Grill, you got to just be brilliant with basics. And I'm just talking about any steakhouse. I'm not promoting them, but just saying the consumer wants you to be brilliant with basics. They've been eating steak out of a box and that doesn't work. But when it's super piping hot, the exact temperature I ordered it and somebody sets it down, that's what the, that's when the dining experience can come back. Um, I think comfort food's next level. So what is an adult grilled cheese? You know, we're, we still want our grilled cheese, but what's the adult version? Do we go ahead and put short rib on top of it? Do we change the cheese out and, you know, you, you know, put something else really cool on? I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, amped up flavors. We're seeing it across the board. If you do your research and just go in the supermarket and watch what people do. There's dawdling around the spice aisle. They're figuring out how could they get more flavor in their foods. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there. And the other one is, you know, really uh, coming through this to serve it up. You, people haven't been served. They've been having to do it themselves and um, being served in, in a way that's, um, you know, inspiring. To them. So I've got a few items I'm going to just rattle through in, in no particular order, but more in different categories. Um, you know, breakfast isn't a meal I've done all the time. And I know there's a, Shane at first watch and a lot of players out there are doing such a great job with it, but really comes down to um, sandwiches and bowls at breakfast time are going to continue to work. My latest things have been playing with breakfast pizza, basically, you know, eggs, bacon, and cheese are in every wrap and every sandwich. Why wouldn't they work on a pizza? And then a little bit, it seems to be the thing that travels the best and even put the hash browns right on there too. Um, been playing around with the, these new gold kiwis uh, you look at Starbucks, it has their egg bites being number one LTO of all times and, and certainly super popular. Now you can just make it your own, make it your own in a little cupcake or muffin tins. 
just make little miniature frittatas and put more seasoning, more, more flavor to that, whether it be roasted mushrooms or uh, different kinds of cheeses or different veggies, and they can still be poppable bites, whether it's for grab and go or even um, as you know, breakfast extras. Um, things like overnight oats, doing uh, blending a watermelon and straining out the watermelon, using the juice for, you know, make your own Gatorade. Just put a, a spit, pinch of sea salt in the watermelon juice, but take the pulp and make your overnight oats with that. Uh, I talked about the bowl with the Kahlua pig and doing it in an Instapot. Maybe you're putting faro in that bowl. Think about things like take people on vacation. They haven't been able to travel. So make food the vacation. What about a Moroccan summer bowl that has harissa and you put in uh, tabbouleh instead of couscous so it becomes not only flavorful and different and romantic, exotic, but at the same time, it's healthy. Uh, maybe a trip to Maui for a Maui tuna crunch. You know, crunch, it's like crunch time. That's a missing thing. When you send Poon home in a box, it's not crunchy anymore. It's, it's so cheese is great on pizza because it's cheesy, gooey, warm, best takeout food ever, but it's not crunchy. So is crunch missing? How do we put that in everything? And so with that, you know, there's the, I just talked about pressure cooking. What about air fryers? Why do we fry food if we can air fry it? Why not put it in there and think about different ways to crunch it? Do you put, do you grind up Cheez-Its? Do you grind up potato chips? We've used panko. I mean, there's just a million things we can do to make things crunchy. Um, for example, uh, taking tamale and instead of putting it in a corn husk, bread it with something, make tamale tots, little poppable things, and then you, you can all figure out what kind of sauce. Um, what about a Yucatan chicken using thighs or parts that we don't use? And then take the thigh, take the skin off, make little cracklings out of the skin, make a little crack, crackling taco out of the skin, make it super spicy. Use a different chili, maybe using guajillo. We saw Fresno in the other thing. I totally agree that chilies are not explored. There's life after chipotles. And, you know, is pad thai the new pasta? Pasta is not something I would put on a new menu coming out because people are tired of it. It's sure it's fun, but what's the new pasta? Is it pad thai? Is it pad thai gone in a different direction? And then what about fun things like skewers? How about for kids? One thing I did recently with my grandkids is take a uh, corn cobets and little pieces of it, put a stick in it, a chopstick so they don't poke themselves with it. And I let them roll their own street corn in, in like a little bit of mayonnaise and, uh, and Parmesan. It was a complete mess, but man, they, they were involved and they eat fresh corn. And then uh, coming up with some, Fun stuff like uh, shrimp with lime and put some chilies in it. Again, maybe using the Anna, uh, the Fresno chilies here and, and then uh, put Monterey Jack cheese on it and do it like escargot, call it jacked up shrimp. This is an item I've been working on it, where it's really savory from the lime, but it takes two minutes to cook it on a metal skillet. And some sizzle going on with it as well. Um, what's, what is the topless tamale? I'll let you figure that out. Uh, regional, I think, is never going to go. People, if they've gone out, they haven't gone very far because they're not on airplanes. So what about local beers? We've been playing up in uh, North Carolina because we can drive there. Um, pimento cheese. It's like ridiculous. How much pimento cheese can you eat? But what, what, what happens when tzatziki meets pimento cheese? How cool is that, right? Um, shrimp and grits. It's just comfort food, never going to go wrong, but so local. Maryland crab. How do we reinvent things that are really local? Can we get hyper-local? In restaurants that thought they were too big of a chain all of a sudden knock that noise off and start becoming more in, 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 in their own communities. Um, talked about, you know, the spins on things like pimento cheese with tzatziki, but what about wasabi and the guacamole? How many times have you seen a little bit of wasabi on the side of the plate and somebody thought it was avocado, but it wasn't, right? Why not put it in there anyway and do it with something else like uh, rare tuna? Talked about tamale tots and air frying. And then what about cocktails? The other day I had a Bloody Mary just for lunch, but I put a lot, so many veggies in it, I had to eat it with a spoon. It was awesome. I felt great when I was done. I think I was healthy. Um, and then if that's not enough, that's where you put your adult grilled cheese. Go ahead, put some manchenko on it. Toast that thing up nice and thin on the bread. Manchenko adult grilled cheese with a Bloody Mary. Is that, what is wrong with that for lunch? You can take it from there. You want, you want different cheese, go for it. But I just think that's really cool. I think that, um, you know, we talked about the woju or watermelon juice. How awesome is that? I haven't worked on blueberry yet, but that's next. Um, and then the idea of a tiki bar, I think, is just hidden. It's as hidden as tiki bars are themselves. But, you know, just making up some cool drinks. Maybe get the, there's so much sugar and sweetness in them. How do we reinvent 
tiki drinks and make them fun as a, as a way to escape. Um, I talked about immunity before, about mushrooms, blueberries, citrus, salmon specifically with its omega-3s um, and vitamin D, uh, dark green leafy vegetables. These are all things that we should just, the, you know, consumers do not want to, they don't want you to tell them it's healthy, they want you to do it. So now's the time when we need to, you know, retrench, retrain, and be really confident. If you have servers and you have to train them, I'd get that ingrained in them. Um, these are things we we did at Seasons 52, right? It was, it was, oh, by the way, it happens to be good for you. We never told anybody that. Um, one of the items I've been working on is a mushroom crusted salmon. So we call it the blend. It's when we take like make a duck cell. In the old days, you'd make the duck cell, you'd cook the mushrooms down just in a pan. But what we do is dry roast them in an oven, blind, uh, blend them in a Cuisinart, and we call it the blend. It goes into meatballs, it goes into different things, but we're gonna basically frost an entire side of salmon, cut straight across so you've got this dome of mushroom crust. Again, then put your crust on there, whatever, you know, whether it's panko or chips of some kind or something crusty. Uh, um, just such an amazing immune boosting food. I could go on all day about those. And then I talk, uh, uh, blueberries, I, you might've seen it or may, maybe not, but what I made for, uh, I worked with the Driscoll Group, and I made a um, salmon gravlax with blueberry, but using a vacuum sealer. So after rubbing the salmon with um, gin and juniper berries and lemons, and then vacuum packed it, and you get this halo of blue around uh, this blueberry salmon gravlax. Unreal. Tastes so great, like with a pink sparkling uh, wine. Are you getting hungry and thirsty yet? That's supposed to happen. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think some trends that are going to continue or be there is, you know, kale. Kale's not going to go away. It shouldn't, but there's a fun way to do it. I've been putting uh, um, olive oil and salt on it, and you can leave it for literally three or four days in your fridge. So why couldn't that be? It stays even better than any greens in the walk-in that you've got in a restaurant. And we recently did a remodel, and I had them do that the last two, three days, and it actually softens up, becomes more palatable. And then uh, using it with, say, um, you know, dried cherries, like these dried tart cherries and um, pecorino or something like that, how it really, the salt and sweet really starts to entertain. Because remember, people have been eating mac and cheese and pasta and pizza and burgers, and yet, you know, they need entertainment for their mouth. Um, and then, uh, you know, chilies of all types, we talked about it. Turkey, why do we just eat that once a year? I, yesterday I was in Whole Foods, they had uh, turkey tenderloins. I thought that was brilliant. But I think there needs to be more turkey out there. You know, deviled eggs, a year ago, I wasn't a deviled egg person, but I've, for some reason, it, that and pimento cheese are chasing me. But uh, I think there's so many variations you can make on, on a, a cool deviled egg. Um, you know, I agree with uh, bigger kitchens. In fact, I question, why do we need servers? It's the biggest problem about running a restaurant. Sorry if there's any of you listening, but it's one of the biggest challenges is like, how do we manage this giant staff? You don't do it at home. People come to your house. And, and you answer the door and you cook with them in the kitchen or you cook for them and bring the food, there's no server. No chance to break a promise. It's pretty easy to manage it. Um, just a curiosity, had taco, uh, Bar Taco's doing it now. You order from your table and they bring it out, the cook brings it out from the kitchen. And I have uh, friends that are managers of those types of restaurants. They refuse to wear a jacket because when they wear a chef coat, they don't get anybody complaining to them. They just listen to whatever they say. Um, you know, sometimes I wonder why a soup can't be a sauce or a theme. So, you know, what is French onion soup filet? So if you took filet and you put it on a piece of toast and you did it like a French onion soup, a really intense broth and uh, some kind of really cool Gruyere cheese twill, how cool is that? Or what if you did like a steamed sea bass minestrone or a cioppino, but use it soup, but use it as a sauce. So colorful in a way that, you know, we have to eat the rainbow, so to speak, right? If we eat the rainbow, we know we're already gonna be healthy. Uh, again, I think nose to tail is a comment that we used before when you saw gastropub um, in meant using the whole animal. There's never been a time more than now when you gotta do it. You know, went in the, the fish market uh, not far from here in the coast the other day and there was all kinds of fish, but then there was grouper cheeks. I said, why not? Somebody's gotta eat their cheeks. So I got the grouper cheeks, it was fantastic. But you know, when you talk about, I just talked about using a cheap cut of pork to make a braised pork for a bowl. Um, but I guess in the plant um, movement, I have to 
give them some credit too and say, we'll call it root to flower. Uh, but find out ways to use your root veggies too, because if they're powerful enough to push a plant through the earth and make a flower, then there's a lot of power in sweet potatoes, yams, and things that are under the ground. Easy to manage too. I um, love that saying. It, which one is that? The root to flower. Yeah. Well, it's nose to tail for vegans, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, you know, just randomly, you got to give uh, credit to when you talk about just making little tweaks to something we already know. What about Wendy's coming out with a pretzel bun? My gosh, John Lee is a great guy. He runs the Wendy's up there, but so simple, right? Sometimes we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but now we get a chance to reinvent anything. And guests who want, they're gonna come back because uh, they're gonna want the things they crave the most, whatever, there's memories they had. And if we can just take the thing they craved and tweak it one notch more, what does that look like? Um, but I think there's never been a better time to reinvent and um, chase the idea of being uh, brilliant with basics. And um, I could go on for another day, but it's, uh, you gave me 14 minutes. So there you go. <laughs> Thank you for wow. listening to my noise. What, Appreciate a, you all. what a plethora of ideas in a very short period of time. It's exactly what I was wishing and hoping for. And you can see everybody, if you didn't know Cliff from his past, um, uh, the guy who took seasons 52 where they, you know, they decided to handcuff themselves with the limited calories and the way to add flavor in and how he figured it out. You can see where that mind goes and how he goes to this right away. But uh, great ideas, great ideas for the time that we're in right now, because things are changing. Innovation. That's one of the slides I think is so, so true. Uh, those that innovate will, you know, will, will, will thrive and survive. And those that won't probably won't. So thanks to all of you as, as speakers. Thanks to all of our sponsors uh, in the audience and our members in the audience. Really appreciate that. We're going to close with a video and uh, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you.